Hey, and uh, welcome to the slightly delayed through technical problems um, 28th meeting of this year of the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee. Remember that uh, we should be switching off mobile phones, etc. Uh, but if you use tablets for the business of the committee, either witnesses or members, that's to be expected and in some cases encouraged. Uh, we have apologies from Cara Hilton. And agenda item one today is a decision on taking business in private. The first item for the committee to decide is whether to take item four uh, in private, uh, which deals with the work on Scotland's climate change targets. Um, are we all agreed? We are agreed, so we will take item four in private. Agenda item two, Scottish Government's draft budget for 2015-16. Second item today is, uh, as we planned, to take evidence on the, the draft budget on the theme of SRDP climate measures. This is the second evidence session the committee has held with stakeholders on the draft budget. And following today's session, the committee will also hear from the Minister and the Cabinet Secretary uh, on the 19th and 26th of November. Um, we welcome as witnesses today Andrew Bower, Deputy Director of Policy, the National Farmers Union of Scotland. Alan Hampson, Programme Manager, uh, Land and Freshwater from SNH. Uh, Lynn White, Agricultural Development Manager at the Soil Association Scotland. Um, and David McCracken, Professor of Agricultural Ecology and Head of Hill and Mountain Research Centre, Scotland's Rural College and uh, Vicky Squales, Head of Land Use Policy at the RSPB Scotland. Welcome to you all. And I refer members to the paper. And uh, I'll kick off with the first questions, which is about the uh, legacy payments from the previous SRDP. How do you think the agri-environment measures budget line will deliver for climate targets, given that the Scottish Government has said that there is no funding for the new Agri-Environment uh, Climate Scheme in 2015-16. You don't all have to answer, but uh, please just indicate and I'll call you. Someone want to kick off with that one? Sorry, I didn't notice. Um, right, Andrew Bauer. Yeah, I think the delay um, that there will inevitably be is going to be unfortunate. Um, once the scheme is up and running, there are some good items that we've had indicated to us will be in there. A lot of the measures around uh, tackling diffuse pollution in particular will be beneficial for both the water environment and climate change and farm businesses. So we think that's a really good multiple benefit. Um, however, there are very tight constraints there and that's obviously going to mean a lot of people are going to be disappointed because there's going to be some fairly strict targeting. Um, so I think it's, it's going to be an interesting process to see how it rolls out. Anyone else? Um, Alan? Yes, I mean, the, there is um, money identified for peatland restoration. Um, and do you want to leave that dish now, then? And come I on think to so, it? yes. Okay, sorry. <clears throat> Vicky? Yes, um, I mean, in terms of the legacy agreements, there are things in there that will be of benefit to the climate. So many of the habitat measures, for example, um, are positive particularly in terms of climate adaptation, helping species adapt. Um, and there are other measures that will lead to some carbon reductions, but obviously that's quite a limited pot of money. And historically that has been more focused, and we think quite rightly, on some biodiversity measures. So this, this gap year um, is, is problematic. I have to say from, from reading the budget figures, it's very difficult to, to understand. It wasn't entirely clear from the figures presented um, that that didn't include agri-environment spend under the new programme for 2015-16. So as I understand it, what's been put forward is the peatland restoration money, um, the, the beef pot and some other things, and the legacy spend. Um, so it would be helpful if figures were better presented in future to actually understand what the expenditure was relating to. Okay, David McCracken and then Lynn White. 
Yeah, and just to add to that, I mean, uh, at least throughout 2015-16, there will be the Farming for a Better Climate programme running. Uh, it's a relatively small, well, a very small proportion of the overall pot, but that has actually shown proven benefits from a from a farm perspective, both from a financial perspective and a, an environmental perspective. So, so some small consolation there from a from a climate measure uh, aspect as well as the peatland action. Uh, once it gets up, farming in, for a better climate, the budget is actually 0.4 of a million, not 0.3 of a million. Well, it's actually 300. Hundred and seventy-three thousand. So that's it's a, it's a question of where you round, whether you round up or round down. Uh, but yes, oh, I think that sounds like up to me. <laughs> Lynn? Um, just um, with the, the legacy side of things, uh, on the organic front, it was uh, very good to see that um, our organic farmers were given the option to take on transition money for the, for a five-year contract. Obviously, organic providing quite a few multiple. Uh, benefits, so uh, we thank for that, that uh, our farmers can get their maintenance payments for another five years. Thank you. I should just perhaps at this stage um, declare an interest as a member of the Soil Association, um, just in case further questions later on uh, relate to things which you know you might see as being partial. They're not. I'm trying to be as impartial as possible, because we have to quiz the ministers after this, and we want to get the best picture across the way. Um, in oral evidence to the committee on the 5th of November, Willie McGee of the Forest Policy Group highlighted the need to increase the level of payment land managers receive for carrying out forestry measures so that more land managers take up forestry schemes. Um, looking at the level of payments to land managers for measures under the previous SRDP Agri-Environment Scheme, how do the payment levels... Uh, affect the uptake at that time and what can be learned from this in funding the forthcoming agri-environment climate scheme? Davy. <coughs> Not to answer your question directly, I think there's a bigger question there in terms of how polarised we actually keep uh, uh, activity on farms. Uh, uh, going forward to address climate change, to address biodiversity issues. There's a need for a much more integration between woodland management and farming on farms, and certainly the relatively small proportion of funding available in the pot uh, currently for woodland uh, 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 creation, uh, or farm woodland creation, uh, doesn't really sort of reflect uh, the, 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 that direct potential direction of travel and the potential benefits that could be uh, achieved uh, if more was actually done on farms. Not replacing farms with woodland, but actually integrating woodland much more closely onto farms. When you uh, have the opportunity to read last week's official report from this committee, you'll see a lot of discussion about that. And uh, therefore, once you've perhaps reflected on that and we've reflected on it, we may be able to take up these questions a good deal more. So Vicky Swales then, Lynn White. I think the payment rates are obviously a critical factor in terms of uptake and whether somebody's going to go into a scheme or has gone into it historically or not. But, but I think there's bigger issues around um, the accessibility of the scheme and how easy or not it is for farmers or other land managers to get into it. And we all know the, the challenges we've had historically when rural priorities was brought in. And I have to say, I think a great deal is being done for the new schemes to, to think about accessibility, to improve it and to put in place a process that will actually mean it's possible for farmers and land managers to get into agreements going through right from a, an audit in the beginning and taking people through a process so that they know what they're under, um, they understand what they're signing up to. So yes, payment rates are important, but it's, it's the whole package of, of the scheme itself that's going to matter too. We're hoping that modernised uh, uh, computer schemes make it easier because inevitably people have to learn as they go along, I guess. But we'll be asking the ministers about that as well, for sure. Um, Lynn White? Um, just on the practical side of things, um, I run Future Proofing Scotland's Farming and one of the uh, events that we do run is woodland management and biomass and they've probably been one of the most popular ones and it has been commented along how do you get farmers along. I think obviously the payment rates are really important but actually looking at the practical side of things about what they can actually do in their farm with what they've got, the potential for where do they plant, why do they want to plant and what the, their overall objective is to is to be, uh, and obviously the the new scheme has agroforestry in it. Um, obviously, there's there's not more money for it, but 
the potential to increase farm efficiency, productivity and resilience through agroforestry. We've already done two events on agroforestry and uh, we had good attendance them as well. I think, again, on a very practical level, we brought somebody up that was actually doing it from England, but got the experience across and did a good farm visit in the afternoon, looking at an orchard and obviously looking at other woodland that could be adapted. So I think, yes, obviously the payments are important, but I think we need to get the practicality of these kind of things across as well to people to make sure that we're engaging on the fact that it's not just what they plant, but what they utilise on their farm and they see the benefit all round. Issues that we may well come on to later on. Um, Alan Hamson. I was just going to emphasise the fact that I mean the advisory service will be crucial in getting farmers to look at the holding as a whole, um, and as people have been saying, deliver multiple benefits. I mean, of the 22 needs identified for the new SRDP, um, 18 of those are identified as going to be the cross-cutting theme of climate change. So I think we need both the advisory service helping the farmers take that more integrated view of of the farm, but there's also I think in terms of facilitation an issue about cooperation as well, because very often you get more benefit from lots of neighbours um, pursuing a similar objective, particularly in relation to woodland, um, especially if that woodland is, say, to uh, restore a floodplain. Um, so I think the facilitation uh, money that will come through the Cooperative Action Fund will also be very important. Davy, mm -hmm. Just to echo that, I mean, facilitation is key. Uh, and uh, when we're when we're looking at the activity uh, across the SRDP, we shouldn't uh, we shouldn't think that it's only one type of program that will actually make a difference as far as farmers are concerned. Farmers are very conservative with a small C, like we all are, and um, they have a tendency to actually listen to uh, 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 wait and listen to hear what they're hear what's been said by a number of different organisations and agencies before they'll actually take that plunge to go the right direction. So key to getting as big a bang for the buck in the next SRDP is having joined up messages coming from different directions in terms of what farmers can actually do on the ground. As I say, I think we'll probably come on to some of that later on as well, the interactivity. Um, right, that's a good start. I'm um, thinking about the forthcoming agri-environment uh, climate scheme. Claudia Beamish. Vina, good morning to the panel. Um, as, as the panel knows, uh, land managers will be able to apply for annual management and capital projects for a wide range of environmental pro uh, purposes. And there is currently not that much detail uh, about the measures that will be funded under this future scheme um, for 2016-17. Uh, as, as they're not on the panel today, I'd just like to highlight um, from Scottish Wildlife Trust um, a written submission that they argue and I quote, this round of spend lacks ambition in terms of funding to truly deliver a carbon sequestering landscape that would rebalance Scotland's carbon budget. Um, and the soil associations here today, and I know you've, you've made comments about that as well, um, Scottish Environment Link um, has highlighted that a minimum of 60 million per year is needed to adequately meet the objectives. Now, obviously, funding isn't the only issue, and, you know, we're not, you know, there's, there, 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 there's a balancing of the different um, uh, funds that needs to be addressed. But I'd appreciate comment on that, but also um, views on the effectiveness of the spend from um, the outgoing SRDP Agri-Environment Scheme in creating carbon sequestering landscapes and what lessons can be learned for the the forthcoming scheme. Davy, um, well, I mean, two things. Yes, you know, it, 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 it can be, and it will be, and it is being argued that the, the, the current scheme potentially lacks ambition. Uh, having been involved as a number of people on the panel. Uh, in looking at agri-environment over the last sort of 12, 18 months and how the new scheme could actually potentially operate. Uh, there's clearly been an acceptance that funding would be limited, but trying to actually make as uh, bigger benefit as, as we could from the action. So there's been a lot of uh, activity going into how best to actually, where best to target some of these measures, what multiple benefits that, that can actually arise from them. You know, the devil will be in the detail in how that's actually applied and, 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 and ourselves uh, involved in that process are still as much in the dark as to how effective that will actually operate on the ground. And it will, it does come back a lot to what you were talking earlier on about the IT scheme and how it's capable of highlighting to farmers and landowners what type of things are actually, are actually capable 
capable there. Um, in terms of the effectiveness of spend from, from, from the outgoing SRDP, then part of the reason why we put such a focus on targeting things, trying to target things better within the new SRDP wasn't solely to reflect the, the, the reduction in funding levels. It was to reflect that there has been, not just in the last SRDP, but over a number of years, quite a scattergun approach to what actually happens where in the landscape. And for many of these environmental issues and climate change issues that need to be addressed, there needs to be a much more collaborative or, 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 or focused uh, attempt of having a number of farmers in a particular area doing a certain things that sort of complement each other. That's what the aspiration for the, the new scheme actually is. Whether it works in practice, uh, then that is, it's, 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 it's still open to uh, see what actually happens. But at least I would say there's a, there's a move in the, in the right direction that way. We've got Vicky, Andrew and Alan. That order. I think we do feel the, the, the new programme, and particularly the Agri-Environment Climate Scheme, lacks ambition. It lacks funding at 355 million, 27% of the, the budget. That really isn't sufficient from some of the estimates that have been done when you think about what that, that is trying to deliver against. So we have our designated sites, we have priority species and habitats in the wider countryside. Um, CEPA have been pushing hard for options which will help deliver against the water framework directive objectives and water quality issues. And then of course we've added in climate objectives to, to this new measure. So when you stack all those up, um, that's a pretty big challenge. Now obviously there are opportunities for um, doing things which deliver multiple benefits and win-win situations and, and um, we very much hope that that is what will come out of, of the new scheme. That additional funding for things as, as Davies mentioned for um, cooperation or collaboration, I think doing things at landscape scale will help to add benefit to that. And there has been some enhancement to the funding for advisory services, probably still not enough in our view, um, that again will, will help to get more bangs for our buck in terms of delivering against our environmental objectives. Um, but, you know, we, are, we do have an SRDP which overall is severely underfunded and I think it's going to be a big challenge looking ahead. On the effectiveness of current spend issue, um, there's a very big problem there and that's poor monitoring and evaluation and data to tell us actually what were the outputs and the outcomes of the spend that we're making. Now some of that is down to EU rules and the monitoring and evaluation framework that's handed down which, which puts forward some fairly crude indicators and measures, you know, how much land went into agri-environment schemes. It doesn't really tell you did it deliver climate benefit, did it deliver for biodiversity, etc. So I think for this, this time we really have to look hard at putting in place proper monitoring and evaluation and that may mean out with and finding some funding out with the SRDP programme, the limited budgets that are in that for monitoring and evaluation, and seeing how we can boost that and get a better picture of whether we're truly delivering value for public money. And there's two demands for money, for a start. More money from outside the SRDP and some rejigging of the budget within it. Can you put in the record just now where the money should come from within the SRDP for the priorities that you see? Within the SRDP, we have raised questions to this committee before um, about the amount of money that's being spent on LFAS. That's not to say that we don't think money should be going to the more disadvantaged parts of, of Scotland and helping support agriculture in those areas. But the, the scheme as it stands is poorly targeted. The bulk of the money goes to the more productive or more intensively managed parts of the less favoured area. It doesn't support the high nature value farmers that we would see in the north and west of Scotland. So one question would be, is that the right level of spend? I think it's 35% of the budget. It's a big ticket item. Um, questions have been raised about it by the European Commission. I think we need to have a hard look at that and see, could some of that money be better targeted and free up some money for some other measures? Is this not a transitional period, really, for up till 2018? where, you know, much more of these sort of things will be f better focused, especially because we're talking about um, the extreme fragility of many communities which may not have a high environmental status, but they are actually communities that desperately need to have that kind of support given Scotland's northerly latitude, etc. But I would argue if you look at the distribution of spend of LFAS, it's not those vulnerable communities that are getting the bulk of the support. In the new LFAS 
Are in, the new El, that... in the new LFAS, nothing changed. So by 2018, we have to move to the area of natural yep. constraint designation, which, as I understand it, will actually increase the amount of land that will be designated. We have at that opportunity, as we indeed do now, we could have come up with a whole new scheme if we'd wanted to. The government has taken the decision to continue the current scheme up to the point of redelineating under areas of natural constraint. Um, you're absolutely right, there's a transition period going on. We've seen big changes in Pillar 1. But again, I would argue that a lot of that money in Pillar 1 has not gone to those vulnerable communities, to the crofters, to the high nature value farmers in the north and west of Scotland farming in difficult conditions. The bulk of that support is going to the more intensive sectors, arable, dairy, and some of the more intensive end of the, the beef sectors, even though there's been some redistribution, which I accept. But if you, if you were to map the distribution of funds, you would see most of it going to east and south and west Scotland and not to the north and west. Uh, Alec Ferguson. Uh, well, thank you, Convener. I'd, I'd love you to come and give a lecture on that basis in, in, in Dumfries and Galloway, which I represent, because the fact is that over the next, uh, over the next period of, of CAP, um, many farmers are going to have their single farm payment reduced by 50% and more, uh, and that money is being redistributed to the north and the west of the country, largely. So I, I, I'm, I think there is some discussion to be had in the point you've just made. Dave? Full stop, really. Dave Thompson? Well, if Andrew wants to answer. Well, there are several people to come in, Andrew and uh, Alan, first of all, but uh, I think it's important that we get this uh, element mm -hmm. here. Okay. Come back to Claudia if she had any final points on her own question. No, but I'm, but we, I'm we get the others. Yeah. So Andrew and Alan, first of all. Thank you. I, I think we're in a, you know, we have a transition with this round of cap reform, but we're really in a sort of decade-long, if not more, process of reform of the cap and a, you know, refocusing. I think it'd be a bit churlish if anyone on this panel said that um, the SRDP was lacking ambition here. You know, we're we're all operating under severe budget constraints. Farming broadly accepts the settlement it's got out of the SRDP. You know, yes, we would have liked to have seen what's happened in other EU member states where there's been a much stronger focus on research and innovation and knowledge transfer as, uh, you know, a, as a way to move agriculture, you know, bring about a step change in practice. But that's not what we have here. So we have, um, we have money going into Elfast, but we equally have large budgets for um, agri-environment climate. And, I, you know... It's, uh, you know, we, we, we need to be mindful. We're also talking about monitoring and evaluation. Yes, it'd be nice to do monitoring and evaluation and things like that, but there are a lot of transaction costs there. And part of the problem that there is going to be with the, there has been with the previous cap and there will be with the next cap is the audit risk there. And, you know, everyone's tying themselves in knots to create a system that is bomb-proof when the EU auditors arrive that builds in huge complexity. If we build in more complexity with more monitoring and evaluation, then I think we start losing the real spend on the ground that brings about the real change. And uh, Alan? I, I was just going to go back to the sequestration point that um, Claudia raised. I mean, while sequestration is important, it is only part of the picture. Um, I mean, emissions reduction is actually the bigger and longer term game. So I think there's a danger of focusing on sequestration in the short term and, and not addressing some of those longer term behavioural changes. So, I mean, what we're looking for is a package which is delivering multiple benefits. So the landscape that we're aiming to achieve is a landscape which emits um, far less greenhouse gas as well as help sequester it. Um, I mean, in terms of sequestration, there's obviously money for peatland restoration, which we're going to come on to, but there's also the money that was spent and is being spent on forestry as well, which is sequestering as well. Um, so, I mean, I, I think what, what we really need to make sure is that we are um, not overlooking that emissions reduction and behavioural change side, and that in terms of um, sequestration, we, we can also look beyond the SRDP. I mean, there are starting to emerge market mechanisms um, which are encouraging that. So part of that behavioural change, I would argue, is to encourage land managers to look more broadly beyond just support through the SRDP. Um, just before the rest of the panel think they're going to get a, ch a chance to speak, 
Um, we've got two bits of questions. Jim Hume and D Dave Thompson, can we, I don't know, let's see whether they're somewhat similar and we can try and get the panel to respond as yeah. well. It, 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 it's definitely on the agri-environmental schemes and measures, etc. Our uh, draft ba budget figures that we have uh, states uh, agri-environment measures are going to be 46.8 million, which is up about 7.1% uh, in, in, in real terms, but the payments and inspection admin costs are actually increasing to a similar amount, 45.4 million. That's almost a 30% increase. And a note from the NFU submission that they were a little frustrated that the government had changed its mind regarding smaller schemes being accessed locally and, and continually. Obviously, it looks at first glance that more and more is being done centrally, uh, and uh, that is causing more admin costs, etc., which is probably taking quite a lot of money out of actually being delivered on, on the ground rather than being delivered to, well, I suppose, civil servants. Yeah, I think we've, you know, Scottish governments and, and, and all of Scotland has suffered, you know, because of disallowances in the past due to, you know, um, problems with audits. The, the figure is very high. We're moving into, you know, the, the European Commission um, officials have uh, admitted that they've, they've failed in two out of those three ambitions. They were trying to make the next cap greener, fairer and simpler. By their account, they've made it greener and fairer, but they are quite willing to put their hands up and say they've completely failed to make it simpler. So I think the reason you're seeing such a significant increase there is there is vast amounts of new mapping and administration and IT systems that are going on behind the scenes to ensure that we can deliver to the standard that the European Commission will accept. And that, that has led to some unfortunate consequences. One of them is the loss of continuous local assessment of projects. And that, you know, as we understand it, we will be moving to certainly in year one, a one month assessment window and potentially, um, you know, not really seeing spend on the ground until 2016, which is deeply regrettable. Is March, which is probably one of the busiest times. For I, I don't, I cannot foresee. Certainly not, unless you're rolling over or, or, or applying for a scheme that you've been in the past. You know, perhaps a management scheme. I can't see how, for somebody doing a capital project, you're ever going to be able to get your application in time to meet that window next year. Therefore, I foresee that you're not really going to see capital spend of any great degree until 2016, which perhaps means projects not really happening until late in 2016. Graham Day on this point. Yeah, just a general reaction to that you know one of the, the frustrations if you like sitting on this committee is is we start off with the cap process and everybody talks about the need to simplify the cap and let's make it nice and easy much better than it's been in the past and then every vested, vested interest comes along and comes up with all sorts of clever ideas to try and protect their funding streams and get what they want we end up with a very complex cap is it any wonder it becomes bureaucratic with the costs that relate to that is that a rhetorical question? Yes. <laughs> right. um, I was hoping to get an answer from somebody. Um, Andrew Bauer, better come Certainly, out. I mean, we, we've, you know, actually some of the arguments that we've put forward and, and have been successful in the early stages of the negotiation in Brussels were about simplification. Um, you know, some of, the, some of the wins that we had around the use of coefficients to ensure that the, the risk at inspection was, was reduced and the, the complexity around that was reduced. I don't think that was a... Uh, uh, something that we threw in there to, to, to muddy the waters. It was actually to try and clear them up. But yes, you know, it's an it's a incredible process to see it happen at a distance. You know, the tens of thousands of amendments that go into the CAP regulations is incredible. So I don't think it's any wonder that we've arrived where we have. Okay, um, I hope you're bearing in mind the original question you were going to answer, but we better bring in Dave Thompson's question just now. Yeah, I'm well. just wondering um, if, if I should develop the, the point about the less favoured area schemes that Vicky and others mentioned just now. Would you rather I left it till I was going to pick it up afterwards? You, well, you if you pick it up afterwards, perhaps, yeah, because you're going to deal with LFAS particularly. Yeah, but okay. we've got, it's been teed up, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. um, Lynn and then Davy. Um, just to say, on the legacy side of things, the SRDP has obviously uh, supported organic conversion and maintenance, and if we're looking at uh, multiple uh, benefits and environmental outcomes and protecting and enhancing ecosystems. Obviously, organic farming covers a multitude of water quality, soil fertility, and obviously getting back to Claudia's uh, comment on carbon sequenciation, research has shown that 
ad uh, adoption of organic farming in the UK would offset 23% of agricultural emissions, and that's through soil carbon sequestration alone. Um, obviously, Vicky was talking about evaluation and benefits of biodiversity and things like that. There's obviously figures out there already that organic farming gives you 34% more plants and insects and animal species and 50% higher numbers of wildlife. That's already stated. So there, um, obviously there could be a valuation there, but it's also shown in research that you already get that with organic farming. And we, on the basis that um, going forward, organic is considered a national priority, uh, we welcome that wholeheartedly. Okay, and Davy. Yeah, just going back to the, the, the question about the admin costs. I mean, again, I think the question is, or the question that should be asked is, what do you actually get for that level of sort of admin spend? Clearly, compliance uh, and the risk of non-compliance is a huge, huge issue. But if it, if, if it is only compliance you're actually getting for that, then mm, it's, it's quite a high figure. But if, if, if by 2018, 2020, we do get a better mapping of our agricultural land and everything associated, or a large number of other things associated with our with our agricultural land, then that in itself is an important resource, not just from an agri from a CAP and an SRDP uh, uh, management perspective. It's an important resource that, that could potentially help guide future actions, whether they're climate actions or or um, wider environment and biodiversity actions, help <coughs> guide where they might then be best to actually target even better. Uh, Graham Day, you've got a question to follow up. Uh, yeah, thanks, Kavir. Uh, at the same time as, as um, uh, achieving climate benefits, we need to address biodiversity, water quality issues, for example. Is there a risk, as I think the SRDC suggested in its written submission, that increased focus on climate change mitigation and adaptation in the, the, the forthcoming scheme could potentially have a detrimental impact on other environmental issues, such as biodiversity and water quality? So, um, Alan Hampson first, then Andrew and Davy. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't, I think that goes back again to the issue of multiple benefits. And I think what we haven't recognised perhaps as explicitly as we do now in the past is just the, the contribution that a lot of the environmental and biodiversity measures do actually make to climate change. So I think part of this is about better capturing those benefits. Um, as I was saying earlier, I mean, the climate change, both mitigation and adaption, are identified as cross-cutting themes. So I think we're in the, we're in the learning stage at the moment in terms of capturing just what contribution these other measures do make. Okay. Um, Andrew? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm fairly relaxed that, you know, the climate change um, push, if you want to call it that, will not detract from efforts on biodiversity. You know, for example, you've been, you know, um, very focused on, um, you know, pursuing the idea of irrigation storage to take water during the summer. That's great for adapting to climate change. It also maintains the flows in the rivers, so that it has a benefit for biodiversity. And we seem to be getting indications now that that will be funded. So that, you know, I think it, 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 rather than looking at things in silos and saying, well, this is about biodiversity and that's about climate change, I think, you know, you, we and the farmers we represent say to us, you know, it's, it's, you know, it, it's all one thing essentially it's all one system out there so trying to slice it up separately you have to do it to an extent for administration purposes but it's a bit artificial and if we can get away from that and accept that things can be deliver multiple benefits then i think we'll be spending our money more wisely in the future um, and um Davey? Yeah, as Minister Graham said, we did raise it in our in our in our written evidence as, as a concern, and I would still say I would still say it is a concern. Uh, Vicky said earlier on about the sort of constraints on the budget, the big calls on the budget. Clearly, climate change is important to actually address. Uh, we've got a recognition that climate change is important and needs to be addressed. We have got a recognition that water quality uh, needs to be addressed, and we've got a recognition through European directives that biodiversity within protected areas need to be addressed. My concern is biodiversity, particularly out with protected areas, which is, is, is a huge percentage of, uh, I mean, it's uh, over 80% uh, of Scotland is out with a protected area. And again, when you, when you step back and you look and see how things are actually, uh, have, have, a, have a happened in the past, then biodiversity out with protected areas uh, is, is, has not necessarily had a, a fair shake of, the, shake of the stick. Plenty to do then, you know, for yeah. all of us. Um, first of all, Claudia wanted to ask a supplementary, I think, on this. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you, convener. Uh, I'm interested to know, in view of the complexities of the multiple benefits, 
uh, that, that um, the scheme is looking for. Uh, if any, any panel members, and not everyone has to comment, of course, but um, can any members comment on any concerns they might have about uh, the ability of assessors on, on um, full schemes to actually assess um, the benefits from particular outcomes? Um, I'm going to come to monitoring later, but um, in another question. But uh, and to be positive about it, are there any suggestions about um, development of training for assessors? Um, Thank you, if Smills. needed. Um, I, I think this is a really important point. As, as we understand it, there's going to be a sort of two-track two process where um, agreements below 75,000 will go through the local um, SCRPID area office and larger agreements will go to some kind of central panel. Now, we've been seeking reassurances that the appropriate um, experts or authorities would be involved in making the assessments of applications um, whether that's SNH or CEPA or, or um, uh, you, you know, um, those who have the, the environmental knowledge to kind of understand whether an agreement is going to deliver against its objectives. And whilst meaning no disrespect to, to some of the area of officers working for SCRPID, I'm not always sure that they do have that level of environmental knowledge in some cases that will be able to make some of those judgments. Now, I think that... The process that is being put in place will help. Um, as we understand it, farmers are going to have to produce an audit. There's been a lot of work done on targeting to make sure that farmers and land managers can only select the right options. They have to be in the right place to select certain options which have been based on good environmental knowledge. Um, then they put the application together. Then there's some kind of level of scrutiny by hopefully the right competent authority. There was a discussion about whether other organisations, NGOs, should play a role in that. Um, we were quite supportive of that, but I understand that's not going to be the case now. Um, and then there will be a pre-assessment, um, pre-visit, before the agreement is actually given. So that might be where some of these costs come from, actually, in terms of why the costs have gone up of delivery. But actually, I would argue that's a good thing, potentially, um, to make sure that, that we actually do get the right agreements that can deliver things. But equally, we should also be looking for things that do do those win-win things as well. And there are plenty of options in there that can deliver for water quality and biodiversity and against climate objectives. But not always. There are some conflicts, and that's where it requires the knowledge. So, for example, um, there's a big push for riparian planting, but if that's going on open ground, which is habitat for wading birds like lapwing and curlew and other things, that can be a conflict. And you need to have that knowledge to know what things need to go in the right places. All large organisations know that... Uh the more complex things are, the more bureaucracy is required, even NGOs. Um, Graham? Yeah, thanks. I just want to pick up on something David McCracken said. I think you made the point that um, out with protected areas, history has shown that, that biodiversity can suffer in these circumstances. Can you give, me, give us examples of what's happened in the past to illustrate that point? Well, it's clear from our, you know, uh, all the sort of monitoring that's been done, not SRDP monitoring, just general biodiversity monitoring, uh, uh, through uh, the countryside survey scheme, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that uh, we're seeing big uh, declines in uh, biodiversity on uh, largely farmland, but not solely farmland, out with protect well, out with protected areas in particular. Uh, uh, bird numbers, huge declines in bird numbers. I can't remember the figures off the top of the head, but it's something like 50% decline in uh, kestrels. Uh, 50 plus 60 percent decline in curlews and waders, etc., etc., etc. Surveys of, of of hedgerows show that hedgerows hedgerows are not achieving their their best sort of uh, status, their condition. Uh, so the, 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 there's there's a there's a there's a wide range, an increasing range of evidence highlighting that sort of uh, biodiversity in the wider countryside is not as good as it actually could be, and that has an implication not just for what's happening there, but you can't divorce, you can't separate protected areas from what's around it. So. So can I just come back on that, Kavima, yeah. if, if I may? So I, I take that point, but going back to the, to the conflict we talked about at the start, is there any examples currently or from the recent past where pursuing climate change mitigation and adaptation measures has had a detrimental impact on biodiversity? Oh. Um, 
No, because, well, none that I can think of off the top of the head, but the reason for, for that is climate change measures, uh, uh, depends what they are, but largely will, will be effective for further climate change mitigation or adaptation, irrespective of, where they're, irrespective of where they're applied. Biodiversity measures, they are actually quite spatially oriented, how effective or otherwise it will be, whether that's whether beneficial or, or detrimental, as Vicky said about the, the example she gave. So, is obviously one to watch, especially since the question about whether salmon can uh, spawn in warmer waters has been raised by other people, and that the arguments for uh, planting dappled shade and so on is uh, another point of view. We don't know which is correct or whether they're both correct at the moment. Anyway, there's a number of people to come in here. First of all, <laughs> Lynn, you have to wait your turn. No, not so just first of all, Andrew. Sorry. Um, just, I, I think it's important, you know, Davy's obviously raised the importance of not forgetting the rest of the country, and that, that's quite right, but, you know, that country isn't operating in a Wild West situation. We have greening coming down the tracks very quickly, which will likely result in significant areas of farmland being taken out of production, buffer strips being put in, more land left fallow nitrogen fixing crops being planted so there's something via pillar one that will deliver for biodiversity we have the general binding rules which are protecting water quality in a lot of areas and ensuring that pesticides and fertilizers are not getting near water courses we have cross compliance which is doing a lot of the similar similar things there we have the SAFO regulations which regulate slurry storage and agricultural fuel oil storage and recently NFU Scotland has also uh, proposed the formation of a, something called the Scottish Farm and Environment Forum. We're in the very early stages of that, so that's, uh, you know, we hope will be an industry initiative to resolve some of these conflicts, in a sense, before they become a conflict. So if we, uh, ca can we, via a voluntary uh, industry-led initiative, working in partnership with the organisations around this table and others, come up with things that farmers can do to you know, address the decline in farmland birds. So there are both regulatory things, uh, there, there are, you can call them regulation, uh, things like greening as well in pillar one of the cap, and then there are also voluntary industry initiatives, and they'll apply right across the whole country. So it's, it's not that if it's not in a protected area or it's covered under SRDP that it's a disaster area, it's far from it. We'll be pursuing that, I guess, uh, a little more, Lynn. Just on the looking at the, the knowledge of inspectors and things like that, obviously, depending on what the assessment criteria is, is their knowledge of organic farming might be quite important there. Um, as previously, the, there was good documentation and things like that, but um, the Soil Association has previously said that we would quite happily speak to uh, inspectors and government uh, advisors and things like that on that basis just to get across the benefits as we've discussed previously about water quality and soil fertility and getting the overall multiple objectives. Just coming back to your your water and woodland and things like that, we've run a couple of events, one of them specifically up in Aviemore uh, with the fisheries board up there, a local estate and the Woodland Trust where they'd all come together for the benefit of the whole community by pa planting woodland. The fisheries board were there to look at, obviously, the value of the salmon to the community, four or five thousand pounds of fish, seemingly, and the fact that the trees would be there, but would obviously not be in the situation that they would be affecting the fish. So I think that gives a good example of people working together. Maybe that be could be rolled out over other places. We've done one in Ayrshire as well, just to see that people working together, the fishery board, the farmer, the, the land managers, and maybe those who want to plant trees in the right place. We'll park that one for the moment and uh, assess it in due course. Um, but uh, it's a very good point about working together. OK, um, I'm going to move on to peatland restoration at the moment. And um, clearly the SRDP and uh, so on is the delivery mechanism, but the RPP2 has identified the needs of, uh, you know, restoring the cost to, of an enhanced peatland restoration programme of 6,500 hectares a year is estimated at approximately £5 million per year. If this was to be tripled to 20,000 hectares a year, the cost would be around £15 million a year. The draft budget has £10 million for 14-15. Um, we're talking about a number of other aspects there which 
you know, show the disconnect between the size of the issue and the money that's available at present. So, would anybody like to answer the question if you are confident that the funding allocations for peatland restoration will deliver emissions reductions attributed to this proposal in the RPP2? I wonder if Alan Hampson would like to lead in that one. Um, the, um, the initiative was started off uh, last year with the Peatland Action Fund, which SNH has been running. Um, I mean, that fund will, by March, have spent 5.7 million and have um, restored around 6,000 hectares of um, peatland. What we're very keen to do is to make sure that the momentum um, of that isn't lost in the transition of the funding over to the SRDP. So we will be retaining the, um, the, the, the project team that's been delivering peatland action um, to ensure that we continue to develop the, uh, the, the demonstration and projects, that we um, continue to provide advice, because I think going back to the previous question, it's not just about the assessment of the application, but it's also about the provision of, of good advice um, to make sure that um, the research efforts that have been set up continue um, and that we continue to innovate and find um, new ways of delivery. So there is 10 million set aside for um, the, 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 the new SRDP program, um, and we're confident that we can ensure that that money is spent to best effect to deliver um, carbon sequestration, along with a wide range of other benefits. I mean, I think the thing that we've been particularly um, taken with during the peatland action is the extent to which there has been recognition of the other benefits, benefits for not just biodiversity, but also uh, water quality and um, flood risk management. Indeed. Um, you know, we've got this situation where the Wildlife Trust referred to the National Peatland Action Plan statement in their evidence saying there is an estimated 600,000 hectares of restorable peatland and then we need to uh, a step change in action. Um, what's your response to that? Um, the money, I think, is possibly only part of that, though. There is a need to build up capacity. Um, we have managed to um, spend all the money this year, but what we need to make sure is that we continue to build on that because there's little point in offering the money if we're not getting, getting the uptake. Um, I think we also need to learn about the techniques, make sure that the techniques that are being developed are as, as efficient uh, as possible, and that we are buying more for that money than just um, the carbon sequestration that's aspired to, as I said before. There's also the scope, and the Peatland Code is starting to explore this, to use other mechanisms um, to help fund that as well. So I think given the range of other pressures that are on the SRDP, we're pleased that there has been 10 million um, targeted towards uh, continue the peatland restoration work. Would I be correct in saying that <coughs> um, some of these schemes take more than a year to work up? There is and a lead, th th yeah. th there certainly is a lead time associated with, with, with that and that's part of the reason why we're going to maintain the, the project team because if we suddenly stopped there could be quite a lag before we built up momentum again. Um, under the uh, the new SRDP. So there's a, there's a big transfer, a knowledge transfer um, issue in there. And just making sure that people who have already been expressing an interest have the opportunity to follow that up quickly rather than having to, to wait. Just before I bring in Vicky Swales, I think uh, Graham Day had a yes. small supplementary yes, on uh, the first part. Thank you, Kavir. Uh, uh, just to go back to the figures you quoted, is $5.7 million, 6,000 hectares of peatland restoration. RPP2, I think, talks about uh, 6,500 hectares from 5 million a year, and if it was tripled to 20,000 hectares, it would be around 15 million a year. There's a disconnect between those two figures. That would suggest that the figures that are talked about in RPP2 are inadequate. Uh, I think part of this is about just the range of restoration techniques that are, that are deployed. I mean, you can't be very precise. Um, you know, we've got relatively straightforward things like drain blocking on one hand and helping restore water levels um, to the removal of, of um, trees on you know, the other end of the spectrum in terms of cost. So I think you know, trying to find an average in there, what we're doing is we're building up the experience as we go forward um, and obviously the estimates will be able to get um, well, not more precise but certainly 
uh, more accurate as uh, as time goes on. Um, and Vicky Swales. Yeah, I, I think it's clear that the, the the potential for peatland restoration is fairly significant in Scotland and some of those much higher figures. But I think one of the issues is about maintenance and about persuading landowners to, to actually do that with their land um, so that we can maintain peatlands in a good functioning state, um, ideally in, in perpetuity. And, of course, one of the challenges is that um, having taken land, restored it to peatland, in some cases it then falls foul of ongoing maintenance payments under the cat. It doesn't meet the, the minimum activity requirements, um, and therefore it's perhaps unattractive for landowners to, to look at doing that with land in the long term. And so that's a big challenge for us. I'm not sure we've necessarily got any solutions, but unless we can either find funding streams through um, cap mechanisms or elsewhere to, to maintain that land in that state, then, then it's going to be very difficult looking ahead. Uh, is that, Tim, um, you know, one of the barriers that there might be to utilising the peatland funds? Um, or is it, you know, you know, the committee's heard recent evidence indicating of an underspend to some extent, the peatland funds. Would you say that we've got to find some criteria to deal with the maintenance? I mean, you've made the case just now about that. But is that one of the barriers to land managers coming in? Are they seeing far enough ahead to see after the re restoring and then maintenance cycles? I, I don't personally have any evidence to, to, to say categorically that's the case, but I wouldn't be surprised if that was a factor in, in the minds of some, some landowners. Point that's been raised then. Uh, Dave Thompson on this. Yeah, just a general point, uh, just following up uh, on that point there. Uh, uh, Vicky was mentioning, you know, that, that it might not be attractive for, for landowners to do the work they need to do because then they, they lose funding essentially, you know, running on into the future. What would her view be, and the view of the rest of the panel, to a system whereby if people do not maintain the land they own in the way that we need for environmental purposes, that we actually tax them? Rather than give them money to maintain it, they own the land, they have a duty to look after it. So why not consider taxation as a, a weapon to make them look after the land they have? Right, anyone want to tackle that one? Andrew Bauer? Dare I? Um, I, I dare, yes. Um, I, I, you know, there's obviously a, a, a lot of thinking going into issues of land ownership and land reform at the moment, and, you know, ideas like that, I'm sure, in the mind of uh, a lot of the people involved in that. The devil's in the detail. Um, you know, how, how would you assess what was appropriate maintenance, how would the, you know, how would, you know, what would the appeals mechanism be for that, how, you know, the, I, I, you know, it's difficult to say that that would, um, uh, you know, not work or it would work because there's just so many unanswered questions there. But I think, you know, a gut feeling would be is that, you know, uh, certainly under the next cap, I don't think you're going to see a lot of people being paid a lot of money to do nothing. Um, you know, the, the money comes with strings and it's to deliver outcomes that society wants. And if society wants those outcomes, those those public goods, they tend to come at a private cost. So, you know, that, that helping farmers and other land managers meet some of that private cost, is, I think, is a reasonable relationship, a reasonable bargain with them. Uh, simply sort of looking at them to do it for nothing and deliver all these public goods, I think, would, would, would be a bit unreasonable. But, you know, a lot of detail there that's unknown in what, in what you're describing. Hey, Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, it's a point about raised peat bogs. Could I ask whether there's some, any concern about, in relation to the underspend question that's been raised, but also going forward about um, whether there's, within the SRDP, any uh, possibilities that any of the panel see for... Um, communities being involved in uh, in that issue in central and and other parts of Scotland. Davy, 
I don't know so much about uh, the, the involvement of communities, but you, you, your question is a good one and it's a good example to actually use. I mentioned earlier on about targeting, uh, and actually lowland raised bogs is one of the areas within the next SRDP that's not targeted very well at all. It's quite a very, they're, they're, they're themselves are very small. The area within which the, the measure will be available is very large, uh, and so it will need a lot of local knowledge to actually know and advise farmers and other sort of landowners, whether it's, whether it's community action or not, that they actually have that and they have that opportunity there to, there to do that. Um, I don't see any reason why there shouldn't be some level of community action within the next SRDP, but it depends on access and eligibility for the funding. The, and, uh, Alan Hampson. It also, it also depends on um, you know, the cooperation of the farmers as well, and I think that's where the Cooperative um, Action Fund could well be helpful because um, you, you need some incentive to get the farmers around the table, um, and that might also help bring in the, uh, the community. So I think uh, we, we, we're quite interested to explore a little further about funding. Um, the IUCN stated that in the original announcement, uh, funding for peatland restoration by the Scottish Government made clear that it was new and additional money for the environment. With the transfer to the SRTP budget, it's important that peatland work remains uh, as additional and does not compromise spend on other environmental priorities. Um, anybody like to take up the question about whether it is additional and whether it comprises spend on other environmental priorities? Alan? We, um, we understand it to be additional money. Um, and it, as I was saying earlier, I mean, I think there is the opportunity there to deliver far more than just the um, carbon sequestration uh, objectives through uh, carbon sequestration, uh, sorry, through peatland restoration. Um, I mean, the water quality side of this has been quite significant during peatland action. Um, there's a big uh, potential tourism spin-off for quite remote areas in terms of attracting visitors in. There's a visitor centre now being established. Um, there's an ongoing um, programme of... <laughs> there's an ongoing programme... Yeah, just in case <laughs> uh, anybody didn't pick it up. Um, in relation to the particular one that's in my constituency, <laughs> it's going up. Um, so, I mean, I think, but I think, you know, and this part that goes back to that question that was, was asked before about how do we maintain um, these peatlands once they have been restored and, the, and sequestering carbon? And I think that's really where we need to look beyond um, the mainstream government support mechanisms. I think that's where the whole um, notion of carbon trading. Um, comes into play because the peatlands are certainly as significant as woodland in that regard and we've already seen some quite significant progress on the woodland side. Um, the International Year of Soils in 2015 will hopefully be um, drawing attention to the significance of soils as a store um, and um, means of uh, sequestering carbon as well. Vicky Swales. I raised a point right at the beginning about sort of transparency of the figures and the budgets, and I do find this really quite difficult. I hope the money for peatland is new and additional money. It's very difficult to tell in the way in which the figures are presented and in the conversations we, we have with officials to understand. If you go back quite a number of years and look in the budgets, I think it was about 2010-11, the annual budget for agri-environment schemes was about $48 million. And then it was cut back the following year, and now we're kind of roughly back at that figure. How somehow, with all these new added priorities, is that additional money, new spend? We've got the beef scheme, we've got peatlands, we've got water quality, we've got climate. It's very difficult to see how it does all stack up, I have to say, from what doesn't look like a particularly increased pot of money. But it's very difficult for a layperson to sit and know that from, from the way in which any figures are presented um, either through this budget process or indeed through things like what will replace the Programme Monitoring Committee, which was supposed, supposed to report on, on progress on, on the SIDP and there are new arrangements for that going forward. So I just hope that some of those improve and we can actually get a bit more transparency on what's being spent on what. I'm happy that the money's there. Well, I, I, I don't know. I hope the money's there. I hope, I hope this is new and additional money for Peatland because we've made the commitments. It's an important thing to do um, and it can deliver. And, and arguably, we should be spending a lot more on it because the scale of what we could do in Scotland is, is so much bigger. Hi. 
don't think we could disagree. Um, I think we should look at uh, some of this uh, further from what the IUCN has said, because related to uh, the spend in the SRDP, which is limited, as we're saying just now, if not, what, where else in the rural affairs and uh, environment portfolio could peatland-related activities be funded from? It's always useful to have hints from people who are uh, at the uh, peat face, so to speak, for us who are not normally out there cutting the stuff or even sequestering carbon in it. Uh, because we'd like to ask the Minister about this. Have you any suggestions? Davy. I mean, it's, it's, it's not my suggestion. I mean, it's a, it's a pity that Clifton was not unable to actually take up the opportunity to be here. Clearly, in his written evidence, he put a lot of focus on, as Vicky's already said, the need for a long-term commitment of funding, but to look at public-private initiatives in order to actually do so. So, But I, I, he's more knowledgeable about how that could actually happen in practice than, than I can ever be. So, But it is the area of public-private. Yes. But the, therefore, that raises a specific question about... Um, the Rural Affairs and Environment Portfolio Budget. Uh, and Alan? I'm not sure where Scottish Water um, sit within all this, but certainly there is a strong link with water quality, particularly in terms of colour, and Scottish Water were, at the time when we set up Peatland Action, um, initiating their own programme to go out and um, incentivise managers, uh, land managers to, to manage peatland better. So we've been able to build a partnership with them um, and through really coming at it from a, a very different angle in terms of water quality, uh, managed to, to work with them in partnership to deliver peatland, peatland restoration, which delivered water quality and um, the carbon sequestration and the wider biodiversity um, and other benefits that I mentioned earlier. OK, I think that, that's a fair round of... Uh issues there. I think we're seeing progress in this area, but uh, we're beginning to tease out in a good deal more detail how it could be more effective, I guess. Jim uh, Hume has got a small it, it, supplementary. You're very supp supplementary. A new supplementary about where funds come for and regarding capping of payments. Uh -huh. okay. <laughs> it a supplementary. Regarding capping payments to, to uh, uh, cap recipients and also transpar transparency and perhaps a ledger of uh, who actually gets what from cap payments? Is I'd just be interested if that's somewhere that uh, some of the uh, people here today would <laughs> consider useful way of perhaps uh, seeing where funds could come from. Andrew, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm not an expert on on the sort of hierarchy of of uh, precisely who gets what. Um, my understanding is that there are a tiny number of cap payment recipients in Scotland who get anywhere near the level of payment that the European Commission was minded to um, look at. Uh, so I, I, I don't think that would yield anything significant at all. OK, thanks for that. Pardon? Oh, Vicky wants to say something. Sorry, yes. Well, well, just to add, so so any money that is raised by capping, there were some figures presented by government a while back, but I can't remember them off, off the top of my head, I'm afraid, or when there have been discussions in cap stakeholder meetings. It is a relatively small amount of money, but it has to go into to Pillar 2, as I understand it, within the member state. And I would argue that money should be going into the agri-environment climate measure. Even if it's only a few millions, it could make a difference. Indeed. Thank you very much. And Jim, you can follow on now with the beef scheme. Yes, uh, uh, thank you very much. And I should remind the uh, people of my register of, of interest, of course. Um, yeah, it was just uh, the, the Scottish beef package. There's, uh, SRDP has been allocated £45 million uh, pounds of between 2014-2020 and uh, in this next year coming, 2015-16, uh, that has a budget at the moment of £15 million. Pounds. So just a general view on whether that's good bang for buck or it should be focused somewhere else, etc. Andrew Bauer. Yeah, We're strongly supportive of it. The beef sector is one of the, if not the key um, agricultural sectors. Uh, and, you know, we accept that we need to 
transform that sector, you know, really push it on to a new level of efficiency so that it can reduce its emissions per unit of production, so that it can deliver more for biodiversity, water quality, whatever it may be. It's uh, it's different in a way to the arable sector where we've seen high levels of uptake of a lot of these measures already. Um, you're dealing in general with uh, smaller businesses, perhaps um, less attuned to, uh, and this is a very general statement, less attuned to some of the, um, you know, the things that are going on elsewhere. So we think this money is necessary to bring about behaviour change. We accept that this is a fantastic opportunity that the Scottish Government and others have given us, and we're committed to making it work. We certainly don't want to see that money do anything other than bring about, you know, significant change in practice. So we, we think it's very much worth the, the investment. We know that, um, you know, others will disagree, but uh, you, you, you can't bring about behaviour change on, on thousands and thousands of farms um, without in making some kind of reasonable investment there. And we think this has got huge potential. OK, uh, Becky Swale. Um, We've asked the government for details of what's going to be in the beef package, but I have to say it isn't entirely clear at the moment. Um, we have the Beef 2020 report, which talks about wanting to um, have more efficient production, as Andrew said, which is absolutely right, improve carbon efficiency. Um, but that report also talks about a market-led growth in production and sales from the Scottish beef industry. So it's difficult to square the circle. Yes, we may have more efficient beef production in carbon terms, but if we increase production in carbon terms, then actually the beef sector will be doing very little to reduce its overall greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and the, the Beef 2020 report doesn't really say anything very much actually about practical steps to contribute towards climate change objectives. So it's not arguing against spending that money as such, but it's a question of exactly what it's going to be spent on and what it is going to deliver in terms of um, delivering against climate change objectives, and that is not clear at the moment. We'll come back to Jim to wrap up on this one, but Angus MacDonald wants to pose yeah. something just now. OK, thanks, Convener. Um, clearly, um, incentivisation towards uh, meeting climate change targets is, uh, is imperative. Now, um, Vicky Swales mentioned... Um, earlier this morning, uh, the need for proper monitoring and evaluation uh, in response to, to earlier questions. Um, now, there's been some discussions on the need to introduce or the possibility of introducing uh, a compulsory carbon audit for farms. Uh, and it was also discussed during the committee's visit to uh, the Green Cow Facility in, in uh, Pennycook. Um, I'd be interested to hear what the panel's view is on the introduction or the possibility of an introduction uh, of compulsory carbon audits. I think it's bloody related to the beef package, since we're talking about that just now, right, Andrew Bauer? There are a number of tools out there at the moment, things like Planet, that you know may in some way mirror what that would look like. Um, you you always have issues around the complexity of these tools. Planet in particular is, is you know it was designed for land managers, but it's accepted I think now that it, even it is a bit too complicated for the livestock sector. That's not to besmirch our livestock members. Um, it's just that their systems are uh, you know they don't require that level of complexity. So there's there's something called Manor NPK which has been developed down in England and I think is now available here in Scotland as well, which is particularly aimed at the livestock sector. So there are things there that are the beginnings of what you might be describing there in the way of the audit. The audit's helpful if the audit is, uh, I suppose, proportionate and delivers the results in a way that the, far that, uh, the farmer can then use to change practice on the farm. If it delivers him a report that says, you know, you need to cut your emissions by 10% and gives a few vague recommendations about how you might do it, then that's problematic. What we have with, for example, the SEPA farm, that, now that's about regulation, but what SEPA is doing in its priority catchments is going out and saying, here's where there's a problem, here's what you can do to sort it. We'll be back in a year to see how you've got on. Now, they're, they're enforcing regulation, but they're doing it in a really quite a positive way. They're trying to you know, show the farmer how to, to make that change. So if the audit was able to do that, it was able to say, yeah, we've identified... I hate to use this word because I've used it in front of farmers and they usually try and lynch me. If, you, if it says we've identified some inefficiencies in your system, they, uh, uh, and here's, you, here's how you might tackle them, 
then that, that would be helpful if it simply gives sort of high level messages and, uh, and, and, and some nice sort of carbon accounting, then I think that would probably not be a good use of money. Uh, uh, Lynn White. Um, just on the, the basis of the carbon audits, as uh, Andrew says, there's a variety of them out there depending on where you, you draw the farm gate, whether it be feed coming in, inputs and things like that. Um, one of the main things, obviously, if you're doing a carbon audit is the use of how much uh, fertiliser and things like that that you use. Uh, obviously, under an organic system, that's that's prohibited. So, obviously, we're using going into green manures and crop rotation and legumes and things like that. So, the carbon audit, I think, is really important on that front because it shows you an overall look at the business, not just one part of it, as we've been discussing earlier on. It looks at the, the farm holistically. Um, and I think that's important to give people. But again, going back to Andrew, it depends how you sell it to a farmer. We've actually got one of our own, and it's fairly straightforward. It asks you about your electricity use, your stock, and everything like that, and when you plough, mint, till, and things like that. Fairly straightforward. But it comes back with it like a bar chart, rather than coming about with thousands of tonnes of carbon and everything like that. It actually gives you a bar chart and says you could maybe look at this or you could look at this. And it's very positive in that sense. And it gives you two or three that you can look at rather than saying you're absolutely horrendous at everything kind of thing. It actually, it actually gives you a bar graph and gives you technical advice as well that you can go in and look at as well. So it's something that farmers can do their sale and play with their sale rather than looking at sort of getting a consultant or that kind of thing in to do. They can have to sit and manage it themselves. So that's the technical definition of inefficiencies, is it? <laughs> uh, Davy McCracken. Well, just to echo much of what's been said, my, my, my colleagues are helping deliver the Farming for a Better Climate programme, would say that carbon audits are actually key to that sort of process. But actually, it's the facilitation and the interpretation uh, with the, the, the farmer and landowner in terms of what that actually means, where are the main areas that savings could be, could be actually made, and how could they actually do that. And it's not one-size-fits-all type solution to that. So it's that facilitation that's actually key to that whole process. Vicky Swales. Um, we think we should be moving to a system of compulsory nutrient management carbon auditing. It's quite clear that fertiliser reductions and efficiency measures on farm um, are one of the things that can do most in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. We accept that farmers need some advice, need some help, some support. But with Farming for a Better Climate Initiative as a voluntary measure at the moment, the figures are we actually need uptake by 80-90% of farmers to actually um, deliver against our, our climate change targets. Um, it seems to me we should be progressing towards a compulsory system because at the end of the day, most of these things actually save farmers money. It's just common sense stuff. And some of the figures that have been presented under the Farming for Better Climate initiative, um, you know, £30,000 savings overall for a dairy farm, you know, a fairly substantive dairy farm in that case. Some of them are, are much lower savings. But at the end of the day, it's saving money, it's good sense, and it's helping to save the planet. Why wouldn't you want to do it? Uh, th th very good. We'll, we will take the questions about farming for a better climate just after this. Uh, but we'll have Jim to come back since he asked the question. Oh, absolutely. Thanks very much, and thanks for all, all, all those answers. I think they're all very interesting indeed. Um, uh, just regarding the beef and the fact, uh, you know, it's this good uh, money towards meeting climate change targets. We had Nigel Miller last week uh, when we were talking about forestry and if that was a good uh, uh, bang for the government's buck uh, and regarding climate change, <laughs> too, stating that we didn't think we had enough science regarding pasture. Obviously, when pasture is grazed, the, the pasture grows faster and uh, therefore sequests uh, carbon. So I was just wondering where, where we are with the science of, of pasture and the sequestration that grazed pasture actually uh, does. I think the SRUC said something specific about this, didn't they, in their submission? It also relates back to uh, one of uh, uh, Graeme's earlier questions you know, that um, we shouldn't forget that there's a wide range of different sort of uh, uh, grassland and, and, and other sort of based uh, habitats out there that do have an important role to play in carbon sequestration, particularly underground. Uh, and so, I mean, uh, there's, there's, there's an increasing knowledge base out there to actually say that those type of habitats are important. And it's, it's, it's how they're actually managed that I would potentially, I would 
potentially say there's still some question marks, but there's 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 there's, there's, there's an increasing sort of uh, acceptance, uh, at least within the scientific community, that um, it's not just a case of if we want carbon sequestration, let's plant trees. There are other all the other habitats have got a role to play. Uh, Claudia Beamish, a supplementary on this one just now. Right. Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, both um, Lynn and others have touched on specific possibilities for um, reduction of carbon in the in the Scottish beef package, and and I certainly welcome the package as, as a sort of uh, as a measure, you know, that's been added in at the la at, at very much at the last minute. But could I ask Andrew and others if there could you highlight any really specific measures? that you can put forward to farmers that will help with this sum, um, reducing the carbon footprint in relation to units of beef? Within the proposed beef scheme or just mm -hmm. generally? No, in, in the beef um, scheme. I'm not directly involved in the scheme, uh, in the thinking around this. However, colleagues are, and it's my understanding that uh, you know there, there's some excellent work being done in Ireland which might serve as a model for us where they are... They have a very comprehensive system of data uh, collection and analysis, and farmers are reporting in the performance of their herd, where their herd is, you know, the sires and things like that for their herd. So that then allows decision management decisions on farm and management decisions at a more macro level about, you know, you know, should we be doing this or this. So I think. Big data is obviously very much of the moment. Um, I, I think that will be a major plank of the new scheme, but obviously I think there's others who would advocate things like nutrient budgeting and the, the kind of carbon audits that have been described here. But I think it's fair to say that the, you know, the, the, the work is being done at the moment. It's that you know, we don't have the final detail yet. So Through the convener, it would be encouraging to, yes. to hear more about that. Yep. Well, it would be. I, I, I suspect that uh, the... The Beef 2020 report involved a visit to Ireland and a, a variety of people who were on that. It might well be, it might contain the detail that we're looking for there. I wonder if they, Andrew could just write to us about a little more about this. If you Certainly would, can. On this the, particular the, point. This the point particular that point, asked, okay. Yeah. Yeah. That would be helpful. I know there's more people want to come in, but um, Reeve will ask the questions. Thank, thank you, Kivira. Um The Cabinet Secretary... Uh, actually has announced that there will be a, a scope for a voluntary uptake in carbon audit. That being the case, can I ask Andrew Bauer to what extent the NFUS will be encouraging and facilitating its members to participate in that? The, I mean, if, if, if the tool that's there is, as everyone here seems broadly in agreement with, is practical and workable, then we would absolutely be, um, uh, you know, holes full square behind that you know we would have no reason to be there's no you know we see no threat to farming from doing this this is a positive thing it is good for them the environment and farming Vicky made the point you know they should be doing it already you know I think we could all look at our own lives and and see examples of where we're maybe not uh, being as climate friendly as we possibly could be and I think it is about helping people make the the step and in, in behavior change so we will we will totally encourage our members to do that and we'll be promoting that via every channel that we possibly can. But just just on that point, yep. and, and I welcome most of your comments there, the difference here is we expect the public and we encourage the public to recycle, we encourage them to take uh, decisions about changing the type of vehicles they drive. The difference here is this is an industry that gets very substantial sums of public money for perfectly valid reasons, but it does and therefore isn't it perfectly reasonable for society to expect a growing contribution to tackling climate change from that sector? I, I think absolutely. I mean, I don't, you know, there's no such thing as a free lunch. You know, farming gets a lot of money, and uh, you know, we would like you absolutely defend that. But yes, it's quite reasonable to expect back in return. But I think, you know, eh, others might say it's not enough. But actually, what farmers are doing already is is pretty significant. Uh, it, you know, we will obviously need to do more, but what's being done already is probably in excess of what average Joe member of the public is doing. Um, and that a lot of that, what they're doing is in the interest of their business, but a lot of it is extra work, extra recording, extra effort on their part that they're already doing. We need to show to them, we need to be able to demonstrate to them that this is not just a box ticking exercise, that this is going to deliver for the environment, for them, for wider society. 
good farming for a better climate. I like Ferguson. Well, thank you very much, Convener. Um, David McCracken mentioned, has mentioned Farming for a Better Climate initiative um, a couple of times and uh, reminded us that the budget uh, for 2015-16 is 373,000. Um, when you link it to RPP2 and the, the, the carbon savings that are expected, my question is really very simple. Do, 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 you, think it, do you think it's enough to deliver the expected carbon saving? It's, it's a step. It's simply a step on the way. You know, the, the, the initial farming for a better climate programme showed that you could actually engage with uh, farmers, a relatively small number in that case. Uh, you could actually show that those actually uh, financial and environmental benefits were, were, would actually accrue from that. Uh, and the, the expansion out of the the uh, the, 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 the programme in the new uh, funding round to a, a, a larger number of uh, focus farms and a greater aspiration for those focus, focus farms to work with a greater number of farmers within that sort of area uh, uh, can only be a uh, can only be a good thing, you know. Is it is it enough? Then, well, at less than two percent, I have not remembered off the top of my head of the overall budget. Then it's quite a small a, sm a small approach, but uh, it, 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 it's, the evidence is starting to. To, to accumulate that it can actually have an effect, uh, but hopefully under this new next program it will actually uh, the, the message will get out there wider. But we're at the start of the, that new uh, phase; uh, it would be a lot easier to tell you halfway through it. Lynn White and then Vicky Swales. Um, as part of my job in uh, Soil Association Scotland, I run Future Proofing Scotland's Farming uh, program, which comes to an end um, next last events in a couple of weeks in Newton Stewart. And we work quite closely alongside Farming for a Better Climate, obviously, to make sure there's synergy and um, that type of thing. And we're not running events, similar events in similar areas and that type of thing. The difference being with our events is we cover the whole of Scotland. Uh, Farming for a Better Climate obviously has focused farms as uh, Future Proofing Scotland's farm and we cover the whole of Scotland. But as a, uh, and we have Scottish Farm and Innovation Network that will run up and now until uh, August next year which is similar again, half-day events rather than whole-day events. But I think it, it's important to say that these programmes run alongside each other, uh, Future Proofing Scotland Farm, and obviously funded by the government in uh, QMS, which we thank very much for, and will obviously be applying for new money in the new year. So uh, I'd like to put my, my hand in the ring for that one at this moment in time. But um, as I say, we like to work alongside each other, and I have quite a close working relationship with Rebecca Osley to make sure that these work together. Um, Vicky Swales first. Um, I think it's a very helpful initiative, but to answer your question, I don't think it is enough. Um, and I think there's um, not very good evidence that voluntary approaches across in, in many areas really deliver the kind of step change and the transformational change we need to make. So I think the figures are clear that we need about 90% of farmers to take up the various often quite simple measures that have been highlighted that they could do that would benefit the climate. I think it's very highly unlikely that an initiative with this kind of budget and running at this kind of scale is going to get that kind of uptake across the industry. So how do you get the vast majority of farmers to perform and behave like the top 10% performing farmers? That's a big, big challenge. And I think both historically and now we're, we've underinvested in that. We're not giving farmers that kind of support, that advice, um, getting the research through knowledge transfer out into the farming community and helping people to understand how they can change the businesses, both for their own private benefit and profit and for public benefit as well. So I think we do need a, a bit of a step change, and I think some of that is moving towards some compulsion in relation to some of these things for exactly the reasons that, that Graham Day's highlighted, an industry which receives a huge amount of public support and actually I think has to do a bit more than it's currently doing to, to help us meet our objectives. Do you have uh, international examples of people who are doing this just now? And if you don't, can you find us some? Um, I, I didn't specifically say in terms of international. I can I can have a look. I mean, I think I think there's been a withdrawal of advice and support um, a, across the board, across Europe and in many countries. You know, there used to be a huge amount of agricultural advice and extension on a whole range of issues, mostly about how to increase production. Um, we're not making that same investment either here in Scotland, in the UK, or in other European countries. I don't think um, to 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 actually. 
um, farm and manage our land to this new agenda, to the new imperatives that we face today. But, but I can certainly have a, a look, convener, to see if there are examples of other countries doing it better. That would be very helpful. Uh, Davy and then Lynn. I just wanted to add, I mean, uh, Lynn set out quite well how the Farming for a Better Climate works closely with the Future Proofing Programme, but I should have, I was remiss in saying that even within um, SRUC, it doesn't work in isolation. So uh, 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 there's many of my SAC consulting colleagues running actually farmer-based events. At the minute, it's, it's something about two or three per week. Uh, it's difficult to keep on top of them, but I can't think of anyone, any of the ones over the last month that haven't had a, 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 a Farming for a Better Climate oriented uh, aspect to it. Uh, and there's, a, and there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's another range of them sort of coming up uh, soon as well. And going back to Claudia's beef question, then uh, my uh, beef research centre colleagues will get a, a, a farmer-oriented open day at the end of the month just to try and highlight some of these sort of uh, techniques that could and should be uh, implemented on farms now to actually help with, uh, with that sort of process. Lynn and Andrew, Lynn uh, first. Just to go back to the kind of saying about people farmer uptake on this kind of thing. We actually do evaluation on the day and then go back to as many as we can six months afterwards to see what they're doing. And we've got really good, quite reporting on that and comments, what they've done, how they've worked with the, uh, their neighbours and things like that, buying bits of kit and that kind of thing. And again, go back to Claudia's question about, um, obviously, things that we might specifically do. Obviously, I would challenge everybody to be organic and that type of thing but obviously I think on a practical level which we do at our events and have run successfully is looking at your soil and things like that we've obviously talked about greenhouse gas emissions and things like that looking at your soil and actually knowing what you've got uh, we invariably over the last six years when we've been running these events it's amazing the number of people that don't do soil analysis now if we're going to ask people to do carbon audits Soil analysis should be very well encouraged. The fact that is, if you're not 0.5 out of your optimum on your spring barley crop, you're 15% down in your yield. Now that's simple in economic terms and looking forward at 15%, you're losing because you've not got your pH right. Um, and I'd like to invite you all to the Scottish Organic Forum Soils Conference on the 10th of March in Stirling, so you can find out more about that. And obviously, again, going back to farming for a better climate, Working together with them, we had an event in Durness, and a week later I got an email from SRUC linked in with Farming for a Better Climate saying, you had a great event in Dur Durness, can you come to Caithness and do it? So six weeks, eight weeks later we had an event in Caithness. That shows the synergy between the programmes and working together. I think that's very uh, practical uh, on the ground thinking that we work together in that way and everybody gets better value for money. I'm very glad you visited two places in Sutherland and Caithness in my constituency. <laughs> I hope you had a good time. Um, Andrew Bauer. Just in reply to the question about is it enough, I mean, it would, be, it would be nice, yes, to have more, but we have a very tight budget. I think if you were to look at the $45 million that's been allocated for the beef package, okay, there's, there's a bit of crossover here, so it's 32.5 new money in effect. And uh, the, the 10 million in the Knowledge Transfer and Innovation Fund and the 20 million in the Advisory Services Budget, large, I would assume, I'd be amazed if it wasn't, a large percentage of that effort and the money in there will be delivering on farming for better climate type objectives. So whilst we may only have 40, uh, 400,000 or so there, we have tens of millions that, uh, you know, of advice, innovation, knowledge transfer and practical measures on the ground that should bring about this change. So I don't think we want to be too down on the fact that we've got 400,000 there. There's an awful lot more lurking elsewhere in the budget. We will explore that a little further, but uh, Elfas, first of all, Dave Thompson. Uh, convener, uh, as was said earlier on, there's lots of change taking place at the moment and will be over the next few years and, and we're moving into our the, the new system and so on. Um, and one of the things I think we have to, to bear in mind is that the, the budget that we're talking about here, a quarter of it comes from the Scottish Government, um, and that's going to be under ever more severe pressure if the reports from Westminster that we're hearing that there's going to be a doubling almost of the, the cuts that we were expecting coming down the line, the austerity budget. So... It's just a, just to, to flag that up that you know we're already talking about you know where best to spend the, the money and we don't have enough there's probably going to be even less in the future and we're going to have to fight hard to keep that share um, 
that's provided by the Scottish Government directly, you know, at the level it's currently at, and that will be very, very difficult, and I think people should make note of that uh, as we move into the, the future. Um, but I was wanting to focus in a wee bit on the, the ELFAS that was mentioned earlier on, and uh, I know that SRUC, in your submission, uh, you were stating that there, there are also elements within the SRDP, such as the Less Favoured Area Support Scheme, where one could argue that climate and other environmental benefits could be more explicitly linked to the level of support being provided. And the Scottish Wildlife Trust uh, made a, a, a similar point. And I'm just wondering, um, you know, we're, we're trying to achieve an awful lot of different things here. We've got the the high nature value, which is really important, food security, and we're looking at maintaining communities in rural areas. I just wonder what the panel think about the the current weighting, if you like, uh, towards um, high nature value and whether we should be looking more uh, at that, given that particularly, and, and my constituency has a lot of crofts and things in the, in, in the west and the north. Um, I mean, what are we, given that there are reducing resources and probably going to be even greater reducing resources, what's the most important thing for us uh, between, say, the climate and environmental benefits and, say, the, the food production benefits? Do you have a view on that? Uh, Andrew? Um, I had the pleasure of speaking to um, Pete Smith, who's a climate change expert from Aberdeen University, who many of you will know, and, you know, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to tread carefully so I don't misrepresent what he was saying when we interviewed him, but his general view was pretty much the most, in terms of food production, the most efficient thing you can do by one measure is grow everything as intensively as you possibly can, but that's a very narrow way of looking at things. And actually, extensive sheep and beef is very efficient because it's the more, you know, you cannot, the human edible input versus human edible output is most advantageous in that system. And these systems are also locking up a huge amount of carbon. So uh, I, I think it would be wrong to, to sort of look at these more extensive systems and say they're not, they're delivering in global terms a relatively small amount of food, therefore it's not that important as the south, if you want to call it that, becomes hotter, more arid, there will be greater emphasis on the north. Certainly Pete Smith's analysis was we're, we're eating too much meat here in the west, but they're not eating enough in the developing world. So actually there'll probably be a greater focus on us to produce the meat that the developing world wants to eat in the future. So I don't think it's, it's one or the other, it's both, but simply saying that, or not both, it's all of these things, you have to try and balance them, but looking at these more extensive systems and saying they don't deliver by, much by way of food, they're not that important, we have to focus on other things, would be absolutely wrong. You'd lose the carbon sequestration benefits, you'd take away one of the more efficient ways of producing food, strange though it may seem, and you wouldn't really be putting us in a very good position if, if we want to be selfish about it, to capitalise on the difficulties elsewhere in the world, because that's what we will be doing. You know, we will be looked by looked on by other nations to provide the food that they can no longer produce themselves. Alan Hampson and then Davy McCracken. Yes, I was going to make a similar point that I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I mean, we're very supportive of high nature value farming. Um, I mean, these farms are often in fragile areas which can be more susceptible to the impacts of climate change. Um, I mean, high nature value farming, by its very nature, tends to be lower input. Um, it tends to lock up carbon, but it al they also tend to be more resilient in terms of those impacts to climate change and therefore potentially more sustainable in the longer term as our climate and other aspects of the environment change. So therefore able to continue to produce food. <coughs> it, it, we, we also recognise in a written submission that the LFAS payment is important to farmers in those areas, particularly at the moment in this period of sort of transition elsewhere in, in, in the CAP. But what we were trying to actually highlight or looking to highlight was we feel that this transition period that we are in looking towards this, uh, the move to the area of natural constraints is an excellent opportunity to actually really step back and consider what is what, what, what are the multiple benefits that we actually want to actually achieve from those sort of payments. If you, if you well, 
you know, you need to go back that far. I mean, the, the less favoured area support measure originally uh, was designed from a social point of view, not from an agricultural point of view or an environmental point of view. We have a good opportunity here now to actually step back and say, what is our situation in Scotland? What is, what is it that we want to actually help support and maintain within uh, those areas, whether it's the high nature value farming systems and the wider environment uh, and some of the production side of things? And how best can we do that? And what role does uh, areas of natural constraint funding in the, in the future have to play within that? We need, a, we need a proper discussion and a debate on that over the, over the coming year to 18 months. And Vicky Swale. Yeah, I mean, we absolutely do need to be supporting our high nature value farming areas for all the reasons that, that Alan's highlighted, the multiple benefits that they provide to us. I think the question is whether both historically and now under this new cap, we are actually going to be targeting the money towards those sorts of farming and crofting systems and helping to underpin them and their viability in the long term. And I've made various comments to this committee that but both in terms of Pillar 1 and in terms of some of the Pillar 2 measures and LFAS in particular, um, I'm not convinced that that targeting is correct and that they're not actually getting a pretty poor deal out of, of the cap. And I think look, e th those sorts of systems look economically vulnerable and they're therefore environmentally vulnerable as we look to the future. And so I do think we, we need to think about how best we can support them um, for all the reasons that we want to looking ahead. Yeah, there, convener. Uh, well, thank you very much for, for your answers. Um, three of three of the answers didn't really sort of give a view on whether we should be moving, as Vicky um, as says, you know, towards pushing uh, a bit more of the support into the the high nature value side of it. Uh, well, one, you, you, I think, Davy, you were talking about, you know, it needs to be reviewed over the next few years. And I think we have to accept we're moving into a situation where for the next few years, we just have to let that work its way out. But looking further ahead, um, how, uh, I mean, do members have a view about whether the high nature value and maintaining communities should have an extra edge, if you like, or is that something you would like to see reviewed in some detail over the next couple of years so we can get it right when we move forward after that? Right, Davy McCracken. Sorry, and then just, just to be clear, I wasn't suggesting we should just let it work its way out, because if you just let things work its way out, then they never actually achieve what you actually want. Things are reluctant to actually change. I was actually saying and arguing for we need what you've just said there, a, a more fundamental sort of uh, review of what we actually want to actually happen on the ground, what elements of, of, of support we want, what do we want to support, how much of, of, uh, of our support needs to go to the likes of high nature value farming systems in these sort of areas and then work through how that would actually be achieved in practice and what role areas of natural constraint payment, for example, could play within that on, and within the wider CAP support budget. And uh, Lynn White? Just if we're looking at high nature value farming as a definition, organic farming would fit perfectly into that. So if we're looking at support and that type of thing and what increase the, the acreage of organic land and obviously it's a national priority now to, to do that. I think that would be one way of actually doing it is encouraging people to to go down that route of organic farming and you would get your high nature value along with that plus another multitude of benefits. Um, if you're very quick, Vicky Swales and Andrew Bauer want to move on rapidly. It, it was just a question about having a good hard look at the rationale for using public money and we'd argue it's public payments for public goods um, and where there's clear market failure and, and I think we've got a bit muddled in terms of some of our agricultural support and what we think we're paying for. We don't need to pay for food production per se, there's a market for food and the market will provide. There are some examples of market failure within that but it should be focused, public money should be focused on public goods. That's a contentious statement, I would say, in a, an area of uh, considerable constraints that we're talking about moving into. You know, we're going to have to, we'll be having a lot of discussions, no doubt, in the next couple of years about uh, the areas of, uh, you know, environmental constraints and the reasons for that. So if we're going to move in a transition, we've got to be very careful about deciding whether, in fact, the market works in a fashion that can help. We know there's plenty of food in the world, 
but it doesn't get distributed in the right ways, you know, in places that produce it. That's market not values. a market factor, it's another factor entirely. You know, there's, it's complex, but I, know. but I would say we've got to be careful about saying, A, food is market driven and the climate is not. And uh, there's only two parameters in this. Sure, there's more no, than two. I'm not saying that. Well, indeed, but, uh, you know, it can, can I come over to, to me like that just now, you know? Be careful, I think. Uh, Andrew Bauer. Just to echo what you're saying there, I mean, we'd, you know, we'd accept that, you know, a lot of our farm businesses are moving, and some are already there, to the point where they are, they, 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 they don't need um, subsidy. We'd like to see more people moving in that direction, but the market does not deliver. A lot of those subsidy payments go straight through the farm business into the pockets of supermarkets and organisations like that. So there are some really complex issues there. I'm surprised that we're sort of so confident, you know, when everyone around us is speaking about issues of food security, that if we remove subsidies from agriculture, that the food will just, you know, just continue to flow. Yes, we need to tweak the system, but we have to be careful that we don't uh, we don't lose a fairly fundamental public good, and that's you know, food production. Which is perhaps a bigger subject for another day, which we hope to involve uh, each of uh, the points of view in. Uh, I think we should move on to being able to find out how we're going to improve the systems, and I hope that we're going to make sure that uh, uh, that is possible as we move towards uh, the... the, the big transition that's that's taking place in the cap. Nigel Don. Thank you very much, convener, and good morning, colleagues. Um, we have previously in this morning mentioned monitoring and auditing and the quite large numbers involved in that. I don't particularly want to go there. I would like to come back in that supplementary on research and knowledge transfer, but I'd like to start, please, by just going back to the basic issue of actually measuring things. I'm conscious that farmers have and those who work there have a pretty good idea in terms of tonnes per, per acre or pounds per tonne, or you can measure nitrogen in water one way or another. These kind of chemical things can be measured. I'm wondering to what extent the panel believes that we know how to measure environmental things. Um, I'm conscious that bird numbers has already been used as a surrogate for biodiversity. Um, I'm also conscious that we've talked about carbon sequestration and obviously carbon and nitrogen in the atmosphere. Some of that will be measurable chemically. But do you have, and those around you, have the tools actually to put numbers to the things that we really want to measure? Please. Right, Andrew Hampson, first of all. Um, the, I mean, this is obviously a long-going issue. How do we measure environmental in, environmental good um, we have used certain indicators as you mentioned particularly birds um, habitat area etc um, but I think what the Scottish biodiversity strategy now recognizes is that these things in their own are part of bigger systems and it's those bigger systems that we actually need to be monitoring and understanding better than we we do currently um, SEPA have done a lot of work in relation to water quality at the catchment level the Scottish Biodiversity Strategy sets out an ambition to develop a suite of ecosystem health indicators which will also be applicable at the catchment level. Um, work is ongoing on those at, at the moment, but the aim is to be able to do broad brush assessments across the country of ecosystem health, taking a number of factors into consideration and then using that as the basis for targeting investment um, in, in improvement um, and also um, well, demonstrating where, the, where there's good practice and the links between um, good ecosystem health and, um, well, farmland production, but also the delivery of a wide range of, of public benefits as well. So, I mean, there are particular issues around flood risk management, um, about the management of um, impacts from visitor and, and recreation, etc. So, we are still using some quite traditional indicators at the moment but the aspiration is there and work is ongoing to develop a broader set of indicators which will help us target resources in the future. Vicky, yeah. next, yes. Um, I think we do know how to measure lots of things. Um, we don't necessarily make the kind of investment we need to to measure those things. Um, you know, one of the reasons we have 
reasonably good data on birds is because there's a system in place through the Reading Bird Survey to go out and monitor those species and there's a particular interest in the UK in birds and hundreds of volunteers every year go out and walk their patch and record those birds we could do that for lots of other taxa we could do it for, for butterflies and plants and our understanding of, of habitats but sadly we don't actually make that kind of investment in understanding our basic biological assets and we do have a slight concern that there's been this sort of shift towards ecosystem services and understanding ecosystems, valuing natural capital, um, which is not to say it's wrong, but what we mustn't lose sight of is some of that basic understanding. And I was at an event talking about the Scottish Government's research strategy for the next five years, and there was a notable lack of basic biological research in that programme telling us about what's happening to species, why they're declining, what the problems are, and identifying the solutions for them. So, so I think we need to watch that. There are, there are pots of money that could help us do some of that research and understanding, but they're kind of sometimes being pulled off to what's the new and attractive and kind of sexier-looking issues around some of these things. Let's not forget the basics. And Davy. To answer your question, I mean, as has been said, there, there are plenty of sort of metrics available at that sort of wider catchment and landscape scale and being developed. I think where we do face a challenge is how to sort of relate that back to the individual farm scale, because it's the farm, it's individual farm management practices that actually will make a difference, uh, and how we can actually get some simple metrics, not very complicated metrics, but simple metrics that are 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 are, 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 are achievable and deliverable at the farm scale to allow farmers and land managers to to actually see uh, where, a bit like what we talked about earlier, where they could make a difference and that that, that, and that, that would have an added value uh, given what if, if, uh, other farmers and, and landowners in that area are doing. So there is a, there is a bit of a, a, a disconnect there. Is, is there a risk in there? I'll come back. Sorry, I'm going to say it again. What gets measured gets done. Is there a risk that you do the wrong things because they're the things you can measure? Oh, that's a that's a quite an open question. It depends on what it is you're measuring and what interpretation you're doing from that. So it's, there's no, there's no, there's always a risk in doing the wrong things. You know, uh, it's uh, uh, land management change, land management change, and what you expect to achieve from that change is always always carries a risk. Could I just interject with a bit of uh, focus on things which the NFU and uh, the Soil Association agree on that uh, the European Innovation Partnership for Agricultural Productivity and Sustainability uh, is a very good model. Um, indeed, that the Soil Association quotes farmer-led field labs, which are run in Scotland and cited by the EU as stunning, exactly what we envisage, uh, provide an exemplar for knowledge transfer and innovation fund. Uh, you know, is that the kind of thing which you think uh, we should be focusing on in this re in this relation, and does that include a climate element in it? So, Andrew. Yeah, and I, absolutely. Um, I suppose the, the European Innovation Partnership turns the traditional model on the head. So, rather than having the researcher, after they've done the research, going out and doing some knowledge transfer and saying this is what we've done, and the farmer saying, "Well, that's very interesting, but of absolutely no use to me." you involve the farmer at the beginning in, in saying to the researchers, I have a problem, can you help me fix it? And that might be around adapting to climate change. It might be, I have an idea for how I can sequester more carbon. Can you help me turn it into reality? We think it's got huge potential there, but it's it, it's it's a change of attitude. It's a change in, in, a, in working, and uh, we're not yet seeing it coming forward from the Scottish Government in the way that we believe the European Commission intended it to be. Lynn? Um, just as that quote comes from um, one of my colleagues uh, from a uh, Bristol office going to Europe and discussing this. Um, as part of the Scottish Farm and Innovation Network at the moment, the programme that's funded by the Scottish Government, Forestry Commission and Zero Waste Scotland and Duchy, um, we've got a number of field labs running, one of them on feeding pigs silage, um, the use of digestate, and we've got one on horticulture. And um, we're actually going to be running one nationally. And um, just looking at it in the last week about the problem with the rashes on farms and how to deal with them in a non-chemical uh, way, and which has had a, 
absolutely wonderful response from all over the country, as you would imagine. So, yes, I think the, the, the idea of, as Andrew says, it's practical on farm. We go to the farm, we've been speaking to the farmers and what would they like help with and what projects we can work alongside them with and having a researcher there taking the data and then uh, feeding it back to the group that might do three or four visits to that specific farm in a year uh, has been has been very well uh, regarded. Uh, just before I bring in Davy, Andrew, uh, you asked for the EIP model approach to be funded through the SRDP. Well, our understanding of what the Pillar 2, the European Commission's vision was that EIPs be funded via Pillar 2 within member states. We're not talking significant amounts of money here. I know that, the, you know, I know the budget's unlikely to change now. So what we're really saying now is there is there a way to um, embed the EIP way of working into the things that are already set in stone, like the Knowledge Transfer and Innovation Fund? Can that have that, that way that Lynn's described there built into it? So rather than it being about the, the lab, uh, the, the white coated uh, researcher going out and telling the, the, the locals what he's found, you do have a much more equal relationship. And Davy McCracken, perhaps finish up this before we come back to Nigel. Well, it was just off the top of my head, which is always dangerous, but it was just the discussion we had about the beef package and what can be achieved from the beef package in terms of multiple benefits, to my mind, cries out for a, a European innovation partnership type approach to actually see what can actually be done there. Nigel? Thank you. Uh, I then come back to, uh, and you've already got to, to much of the issue here, but in the context of the budget, which is what we're interrogating, are there sufficient funds for the kind of things that we're now talking about? In other words, getting uh, scientific understanding wherever it comes from to those who are actually practitioners in the field? Uh, Andrew Bow. I mean, there's certainly, there's, there's a reasonably strong focus in there on Knowledge Transfer and Innovation Fund in the context of a tight budget. A uh, colleague of mine in Brussels describes the EIP as tea and coffee money. It's not a lot of money here. It's about getting people together rather than millions of pounds worth of new research money. It's about getting them together and then you bid for other pots of money elsewhere in order to make it happen. So EIP wouldn't blow a hole in this budget. This budget's already tight, but there is a, you know, there's 10 million in Knowledge Transfer and Innovation Fund and 32.5 new million uh, money in the Beef Fund. So, you know, we, we understand and accept the constraints we're operating under here. Okay, and Lynn White? I would just say, the same as Andrew said, there is money there. It's just a case of the Innovation Fund. The programme I run is funded through SDS money and through, through so is the S Fund programme, which we would presume comes from the Innovation Fund mm -hmm. in the future. And obviously, if there is money from the, the new beef package, we would certainly be hoping to tap into that as well on a practical level. Claudia, a small supplementary. Yeah, uh, it, it's a, a point of clarification, convener, yes. just, to, just to go back. Um, could, could I just check, because I'm not quite sure that I understood the point that was being made earlier, in, in terms of um, food production and market failure. Could I just go back to Vicky and ask you what, what, what point you were making there? Because I'm not quite sure that I understood it. Sorry, convener, but I wasn't sure. Um, I, I think it... The question, I think, was a, about, it had followed on from the HMV discussion and about what we were paying for and what, where we focused our limited amounts of money. And I was trying to say that there are, there's a rationale for government spending where there is either market failure or in order to deliver public goods because the market doesn't deliver those things in terms of particularly thinking about the environment and biodiversity and in relation to some of our our climate aspirations, objectives, um, and water quality. Food production per se, food is a, is, a, is a market commodity and has a market. Now, there are market failures. I totally accept that, and I accept that the whole system around food is extremely complicated. <laughs> so, but I'm, but I'm saying if, we, if we're going to look hard in future about how we spend public money then perhaps we do have to look at some of the money within the common agricultural policy and where it's going and what type of farming it's supporting and the balance of, of that money between supporting basic farm incomes of certain types of farming versus other types of farming or delivering environmental or other public goods. D does that make sense? So, so what we have in Pillar 1 
is a large amount of, of that cap money going to, um, to, to arable farmers, to dairy producers, to the beef sector, who are farming on good quality land in the lowlands, in good situations, close to market, not disadvantaged, um, who are getting the bulk of that support. And if we look at some of our farmers and crofters in, in the highlands and islands, they're getting very limited support. But yet many, their, their agricultural output is limited, but what they're delivering in terms of public goods is very significant. So what is it we want to pay for and support in future? That's what I was trying to, to get to. Right, thank you. Um, does any old question. Yeah. And, uh, before I bring in Graham Day, uh, Andrew Bauer wanted to comment. Just probably what happens. Sorry, I, I, th I think uh, what several people around the table are perhaps thinking right now is, you know, what, what cap are we talking about here? The next cap is not going to, that money is not going to be going to these places. The, the, we're turning it on its head. The money is going to the high nature value areas. Uh, it's not, sorry, 10% of the budget or, or less is going to Region 3. The vast majority of money is going to Region 1, which is good quality agricultural land in the lowlands. There is redistribution within the regions, but, but the system has been, has been set up specifically to almost limit redistribution as far as possible. If you were to map where the bulk of money under Pillar 1 is going currently, it is not going to the HMV farming areas. They have seen an uplift in money. But you're talking about an uplift of a few hundred pounds in some cases, N not, not an uplift that's going to underpin and support the viability of some of those farming and crofting systems in future. Well, if you the, look at the, the budget the, split, you can't argue it's all going to the north and west of Scotland. The ones, the ones that I speak to from Argyle in the north are quietly positive about what's coming. So I don't think they're sitting there getting excited about a few hundred pounds. I think this will see significant change. And southwest borders, northeast, that's the big losers are. Now, some of them are coming from high levels of support, but they're coming an awful long way down. And that money is going somewhere else. Yes, but we also have a declining budget as well. So, you know, I, I don't recognise the characterisation there. I think um, we have to agree to differ on this one, which is at the nub of uh, part of the problems that we face. Uh, Graham Day, finally. Just, just, thank you, Camille. Just, just to back up some of what Andrew Bowers was saying, I, I, like others, I represent part of the country that's going to see substantial sums of money disappear from the agricultural sector. And surely we need to strip this back to the very basics until we get up to the point where supermarkets pay the appropriate levels to farms, which they don't, and until we get to the point where the public could actually afford to pay appropriate prices, which especially now they can't, we need that support going into the sector. We have to have it, surely. Can we just make that rhetorical? Yeah. Just to... <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just make, make one very brief comment? Yes. Next Thursday Since we you haven't spoken for a wee while. Indeed. Thank you. For your, thank you. I, I just wanted to make the point that, that, I mean, clearly there are differences of opinion here, but next Thursday we are going to be debating Scotland's food and drink sector. Uh, which I think all people, all members of this parliament would agree has been a huge success over the last few years. And what we have here is a question of balance, um, because these things are always a question of balance. It's quite clear everybody wants more money to go into everything, but we have to take all the opinions that are taken into account and work out that balance, and I think that's where we are. I'm sure we'll see that in your speech. <laughs> but 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 that's it's it's very well taken. I, I think uh, we, we should really actually try and wrap this up at this stage. We've got an excellent amount of written material, which is as important to us as the discussion that we have around here. So the two balance each other in terms of our response to ministers and the questions we ask to them. And I'd like to take this chance to thank you all for the evidence that you've given us, because as ever, it's interesting, detailed and challenging. And thank you very much for that. I'm going to end this item here, take a brief break because we all need it. And uh, we'll be back here for item three in five minutes.
Petition PE 01490. The third item is to consider the Scottish Government's responses and the petitioner's response to the Scottish Government's responses. I refer members to the paper and uh, seek um, your own responses to that just now. Dave Thompson. Thank you, uh, Convener. Um, I agree with uh, the Scottish Crofting Federation and um, that there are an awful lot of the questions that we as a committee um, asked that, that haven't been answered or have been partially answered. And um, it strikes me that a lot of the letter could probably be described as um, civil service waffle, to be quite frank. It doesn't really... Um, deal with a number of the points that we as a committee raised and I would suggest that we go back to the Minister and very simply uh, list the questions, get the clerks to list the questions uh, that we feel have not been answered, just one, two, three, four, five, six, keep it very simple uh, and ask for those points to be answered properly and where questions have been partially answered then we should uh, also ask for further information in those partial answers. Right, that's one proposal. Uh, Angus MacDonald. Yes, thanks, Convener. Um, I would certainly agree with uh, Dave Thompson's comments there. Um, as Patrick uh, Cress of the um, Scottish Crofting Federation has stated in his response uh, to the Minister's letter, there, there remain a number of unanswered questions, uh, and I think the committee uh, does need uh, some more details on the intentions for funding of wild goose control. And can I just uh, place on the record uh, that, that I'm pleased the Minister acknowledges the, the, the risks from um, large amounts of geese congregating uh, in fields with regard to salmonella and listeria. Uh, however, I think it's more common than the Minister believes. And uh, uh, Alec Ferguson. Thank you, Convener. I, I, I would entirely uh, agree and support um, Dave Thompson's uh, proposition. But I wonder if I could just add a, a, a brief, and, and I wonder if we might be able to refer to this in our response, because um, I, I know that we wrote to all the goose management schemes at the start of this uh, investigation, if I can call it that, and I would put on, on record my disappointment that we didn't hear anything from the Solway uh, goose management scheme, and I think it is not unreasonable if you don't get a response to assume that all is basically well. I have, however, since um, uh, Elaine Murray and I received the deputation from the Solway Barnacle Goose Management Scheme um, about three or four weeks ago, which um, would clearly indicate that all is not well. And, and um, the, the, it's been hugely successful in that the numbers of the Svarbold Barnacle Goose, I believe is the correct pronunciation, um, and this is the only, the Solway is the only part of Scotland where these particular uh, geese um, land. Um, the numbers have expanded um, hugely over the years, um, and obviously the, the pressures um, have increased, uh, unlike the funding which has actually reduced. So I, I wonder whether it is valid to point out in our response that the, the, you know, the, the, um, the, the issues that um, Patrick Krauser has raised through his petition are not just confined uh, to the North and West, that they do also seem to exist in the Solway scheme as well. I think we did get <coughs> evidence of Aberdeenshire and some other places too, at least informally, that uh, are affected in the same way. So you've got a very valid point there. Are you suggesting that we ask that question in the letter that we... Uh, if, it's, if you feel it's appropriate to do so, I, I would like well, to... Well, I don't see any reason why yeah. not. You know, we should try and highlight the yeah. extent of the problem, and therefore that's another example. Uh, Graham Day and then Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, Kibir. I, I, I would also agree entirely with the approach suggested by Dave Thompson, and I, uh, but at the risk of slightly lengthening the letter, I wonder if we could, perhaps at the end, ask for updates going forwards on bullet points K and P, where um, it, it was said that uh, SNH are working with local pilots to ensure they gather the information required in relation to the relationship between good goose numbers and agricultural damage, and also where they're looking at the uh, possible effects on water quality in locks and reservoirs. Um, Scottish Water is working with SNH on Orkney to investigate this further. I would certainly welcome updates as they become available on those two points, and I, I'd like to see us request those. Yes, and Claudia Beamish. Right, uh, thank you, Convener. I'd, I'd support um, Dave Thompson's um, 
suggestion, proposal, and also the other um, additional detail that's been added by other members. And I would just like to highlight under point O in the Minister's um, reply uh, that uh, I do have a concern about whether there's to be any uh, possibility of the Minister or the Scottish Government looking at um, the, the viability of a compulsory bag reporting scheme rather than only a voluntary scheme, which did come up in evidence in view of private landowners um, and, uh, and other issues, which I won't go into the detail of now, but I would, I would value if other members agree a, a response about that as well. Well, I think we should ask the question, certainly. I think it sounds reasonable to see what answer we get. Uh, Alec Ferguson? Can I make one addition to what I said previously, yes. convener? I, it's simply for the, to help the clerks in, in formulating the, the letter. Um, but there's just um, one figure I would give, which is that in five years, the number of these barnacle geese in the Solway scheme have gone up from 29,800 to 38,100, which, if I'm right, is a roughly a 30% increase in five years. Um, the funding has stayed the same. And the point that was particularly made, and this will be the same in Aberdeenshire, um, and, and areas on, in the northeast is that as the um, impact of the cap reforms begin to bite and the single farm payment reduces in these areas, the incentive to remain in these schemes will become um, less, if I could put it that way. I think uh, the clerks have got a clear steer if we're agreed that that's the amount of business that we wish to deal with on this just now. So we need some more answers and we need them in more detail than we got. Well, thank you very much, members, for that. Um, that is agreed then that we write to the Minister and we seek those answers. Okay, uh, we're going to finish the meeting, but before I do, in public, uh, at its next meeting on Wednesday the 19th of November, the Committee will take evidence from the Minister on the Scotland Act 1998 River Tweed Amendment Order 2015 Draft Affirmative SSI and then on the Draft Budget. The committee will also take evidence from the Scottish Government's officials on the Community Empowerment Scotland Bill. I now close the meeting and ask the public gallery to be cleared and move the session into private. <laughs>